This morning will be a little bit different than the usual message. Uh, We're not going to primarily be in one passage. We're going to be in a lot of texts this morning. I want you to know that I've listed all of the scriptures for you that I'll be using this morning in the notes. Hopefully you received those at the door. If you did not receive uh, sermon notes, it's six pages long. If you didn't get a packet, just raise your hand. Uh, There are some men here that are going to hand some of those out so that you can follow along as well. So they're coming forward. They'll, They'll get you from behind. Thanatology is the study of death, its process, and what happens. For a topic that all of us are personally subject to, I'm surprised at how little we consider death. We will often take strides to avoid talk of death, to make fun of death, to make holidays about it and make light of it, or to keep death as abstract, distant, sanitized. But when death visits, it gets personal and everything changes. And for the world, that change is a change to bitter hopelessness. Questions, complaints, slavery to fear, but not so for the Christian. I want to share with you this morning a summary of some study I've been doing over the last couple of years, and my heart was eager to share this with you has been for some time. Uh, Last summer, summer of 2017, was a summer that we as a church collectively felt the touch of that last enemy, death. And what I want to do this morning is get our hearts around the New Testament's thanatology. What is death? For the believer, how are we to view it? And, and to do that this morning, I want to begin with two very curious statements that Jesus makes in John chapter 11. So you can turn in your Bibles to John 11. And in John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus makes two statements back to back that don't seem to make sense. He says, He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do I believe this? I I don't even understand this. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies, and the one who lives and believes in me will never die. How do these two statements go together? Will you pray with me? God, we come to your word this morning seeking to have your thoughts, seeking to think the way you think, especially about life and death. God, we pray that you would govern our hearts and our thoughts, take our hearts captive to the truths of your word and let them be rock solid foundation for us for everything that we encounter in life we pray this in Jesus name amen these two statements back to back seem to be contradictory how are we to live even if we die and have the promise that we will never die if we believe in Jesus This, of course, comes from John chapter 11, which is the story of the revealing of the glory of Jesus, right? John chapter 11 is the story of the resurrection of Lazarus, but John 11.4 tells us what this chapter is all about. Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick. Lazarus was his friend whom he loved. 
Jesus had a special love for this friend. And in verse 4, when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. It's a remarkable chapter. And it is all about Jesus. We're tempted to think this is all about Lazarus. But this really is about Jesus' self-disclosure as Messiah, as God in the flesh, as the one who has the ability to raise people from the dead, the one who is in charge of death, the one who conquers death, the one who gives life. A really remarkable statement happens in verse 5. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Mary and Martha were sisters to each other and to Lazarus, their brother. Verse 6, so when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two days longer where he was. What? He didn't immediately go and heal his friend whom he loved and bring an end to the suffering of Lazarus and his sisters? No, Jesus chose to stay. That is shorthand for Jesus let Lazarus die so that he could reveal something about himself for the glory of God. This is a hard chapter and a gloriously good one. This chapter takes place in three scenes. The the first scene is beyond the river and Jesus waits beyond the river so that Lazarus could be dead four days before Jesus shows up. The second scene occurs just outside of town, and Jesus meets the sisters. Martha says to him in verse 24, excuse me, Martha says in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I don't think that Martha is saying, Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. I don't think this is anger. I think this is confident faith. Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Jesus responds in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus had been teaching his disciples about the end times, about a physical bodily resurrection. And Martha is confident in Jesus' ability to raise Lazarus from the dead on that day. And Jesus turns her attention not to the resurrection she's thinking of, but to himself. And he says, I am the resurrection. And I am the life. And then he gives these two staggering statements. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And you know the story. Jesus goes in the next scene to the tomb where the man Lazarus had died, had been buried four days. He asks for them to remove the stone. They said, don't remove it. The King James Version is fantastic. He stinketh. He's definitely dead. And Jesus moved, troubled, weeping. Jesus loved him, being deeply moved within. You get this panoply of emotions in our Savior. All along, he knows what he's going to do, and he is still grieved and moved and pained by the death and its consequences for his friend. And then he tells a dead man to do something, and the dead man obeys. Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus walks out of his own grave. Of course, G, uh, Lazarus' physical resurrection here is not the point of the story. It is a pointer to Jesus' own bodily resurrection, which is a first fruit of a permanent, glorious resurrection for all who belong to him, for all who are in him, for all who believe in him. 
That is the point of this miracle and the purpose of John's recording it. It is the glory of Jesus as Messiah, as conqueror of death, demonstrating his credentials to say, follow me. <laughs> demonstrating his credentials to say, I will forgive your sins. I will give you eternal life. There are two truths that Jesus declared to Martha in verses 25 and 26. By declaring himself to be the resurrection and the life, two truths for everyone who believes in Jesus. You will live even if you die, and you will never die. Both true. But how do they fit together? In what sense are both of these statements true? That is what I want to explore with you this morning. I believe Jesus is introducing his followers to a radical reconfiguration of the concepts of life and death. And what Jesus says here in John 11 in seed form is borne out more fully in the rest of the New Testament. And that reconfiguration is this. Eternal life starts at new birth Physical death is fundamentally altered so that even the vocabulary of death changes for those who believe in Jesus. We long this morning to have our minds recalibrated about the way we think about death, to think about life and death the way God does. And so we're going to take a nine-part survey this morning of the New Testament's teaching on death. We will go quickly. I'm not sure we can turn to all the passages. I'll be reading many of them. Again, the references are in your notes. Part one, unbelievers are dead. Unbelievers are dead. They are dead already. They were born dead. They are living dead. As John Wayne said in the Alamo, you may be walking around, but you're dead as a beaver hat. The truth is, all are spiritually dead until they are in Christ. Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and notice this, in which you used to walk. This is a spiritual death in which you live and walk and do things. Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together. Everyone outside of Christ is dead spiritually. Colossians 2.13, you were dead in your transgressions. God made you alive together with him. Unbelievers' works are also dead. Hebrews 6.1, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. All those good things, all those relatively good things, and all the bad things, all the works that unbelievers do are collectively referred to as dead. All the religion, all of it. Hebrews 9, 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Not only are unbelievers spiritually dead and their works are dead, also their faith is dead. James 2.17, faith without works is dead. James 2.26, just as a body without the spirit, so also faith without works is dead. There's a kind of faith <laughs> that isn't brought about by the spirit, that doesn't result in the kind of works that only God can produce, that is actually a dead faith. There are lots of dead religious people in the world. Churchgoers can be dead. 1 Timothy 5, 6 describes widows who give themselves to wanton pleasure are dead even while they live. Whole churches can be dead. Revelation 3, 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write this, says Jesus. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Dead churches, dead denominations, dead state churches, dead empires. The gospel is preached to the dead. 1 Peter 4, 6, the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The spiritually dead are 
are the targets for gospel preaching so that they may live. Unbelievers do not possess life. Unbelievers do not possess life. 1 John 3.15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 5.12, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Unbelievers will be judged at the end of time as the dead. 1 Peter 4, 5, they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The dead will not go out of existence. They will still exist as the dead to be judged for their dead faith, their dead works, and their spiritual deadness. 2 Timothy 4, 1, Jesus Christ is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. So preach the word of God. Revelation 20, verse 12, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. A second part of our survey, unbelievers will die. Unbelievers are dead already, and unbelievers will die. They will not go to a better place. They will not rest in peace. Everybody is subject to death. Romans 5.12, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, and so death spread to all men on account of that all sinned. Romans 5.14, death reigned from Adam until Moses. And Romans 5.21, sin reigned in death. 1 Corinthians 15.22, for in Adam all die. And Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for men to die once and then to face judgment. A third part of our survey, unbelievers are dead, unbelievers will die, and unbelievers will die again. There is a second death for unbelievers. Revelation 2.11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 20 verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. Revelation 20, 14, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And Revelation 21, 8, for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Fourthly this morning, Believers died already. Believers died already. You see, believers died at conversion. Colossians 3.3, 3, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It has already happened. Believers died already and they died with Christ, according to the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.11 We died with him. We will also live with him. Romans 6, we've been studying this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We've been buried with him through baptism into death. In verse 5, we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Romans 6, 8, we have died with Christ. Believers have also died in relationship to sin. Romans 6, 2. We died to sin. How shall we live in it? Romans 6, 6 and 7. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away so we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin. In 1 Peter 2, 24. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Believers have also died in relationship to the law. 
Scott has been demonstrating this from Romans 7 for us. Romans 7, 4, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. Romans 7, 6, we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound. And Galatians 2, 19, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Believers also died in relationship to the world. Galatians 6, 14, may it be that I would never boast, says Paul, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In Colossians 2, 20, you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world. And finally, the old you is no more. The old you The you before Christ no longer exists. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Romans 6.6, our old self was crucified with him. In Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, we laid aside the old self, the old man, and we put on the new. Jesus himself said, if anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Christian, you died already. All of these things are realities that have already taken place for you. And so number five this morning, eternal life begins at new birth. Eternal life begins not when you get to heaven, but when you are born again. Listen to Jesus in John 5, 24. Truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, present tense, possesses eternal life, and he does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have already passed out of death and into life, and you presently possess eternal life. John 8, 51, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Sounds like John 11. In Romans 6, 4, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too now walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 5, we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly also in the likeness of his resurrection. That is resurrection living now. Romans 6, 8, if we died with Christ, we believe also we shall live with him. That is not a we shall in the distant future. That is the future of inevitability. It's a reality for everyone who is in Christ. Alive again now as raised from the dead. Romans 8, 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and the law of death. Colossians 2, 12, Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised up with him through faith. And Colossians 3.1, you have been raised up with Christ. Therefore, keep seeking the things above. Sixth, this morning, a believer's life is a kind of death. A believer's life is a kind of death, a death to self Death to the world, death to sin, putting to death the deeds of the body. You see, death to self is the starting point for following Jesus. Death to self is the starting point for following Jesus. Mark 8, 34, Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Considering yourself dead to sin is an ongoing practice. Romans 6.11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Colossians 
Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Putting to death the deeds of the body identifies one as a true child of God. Romans 8.13, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In that context, it is those who are being led by the Spirit of God to put to death the deeds of the body that demonstrate themselves as genuinely sons of God. Believers are dead to the world in which they live. Paul said again in Galatians 6.14, I have been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to me. You and I have an identity detachment from the world. This is not our home. Believers also can find themselves in danger of death because of their loyalty to Christ. Paul in 2 Corinthians says things like this. We had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust ourselves but in God who raises the dead. We are an aroma from death to death. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4.11 We who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 6.9 We are dying, yet behold we live. We are punished and not yet put to death. In 2 Corinthians 11.23, I have suffered being beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Many Christians have walked this earth with a death sentence because of their loyalty to Christ. The church at Smyrna was given this encouragement from Jesus, Revelation 2.10, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. The Christian life is really one of daily death to self. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Entrance into the Christian life is taking up your cross to follow Jesus, and the daily walking of the Christian life is a taking up of your cross to follow Jesus. It's a death to self, the denial of self, living for another, the fundamental relationship of a husband to his wife is to love her as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? By dying in her place. A husband's love is to manifest that in his marriage, death to self for the benefit of another, for the glory of God and the proclamation of the gospel. This is the Christian life. Number seven, believers will still face physical death. Believers will still face physical death. Eternal life began at conversion, at new birth, but you may still face physical death, maybe, with the exception of the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, John 14, 3. Those who are alive when Christ returns for his church will be with him glorified instantaneously, transformed without going through death. Most believers go through death. And death is still an enemy. Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy. There's something very wrong about death. Death is the disintegration of the inner man and the outer man. It is a separation of the true you from your physicality. And there's something not right about the way God constructed humanity that death would interpose and separate these things. Death is wrong. It is a grievous tyranny. 
brought into the world by sin, and it is a tyranny that must be made right. It is a future reality, most likely, for all of us. 2 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Every one of us is currently experiencing physical demise. And some of us are feeling the acceleration of that physical demise. Romans 14, 7 and 9. Not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Romans 8, 38. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, principalities, things present, things to come, nor powers, etc. can what? Separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death is a very likely reality for all who are in Christ Jesus. Physical death. And yet, not even physical death can separate you from the one you love, from the one who loves you. Philippians 1.20, Paul says, According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will, even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul knew that he was still physically mortal, And he wanted to not have shame in his death, but to glorify God in it. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, believers are called the dead in Christ. That's an important modifier. That is precious. Hebrews 11.13 calls Old Testament believers those who died in faith. A very similar phrase. And remember this promise from Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good. And in that context, he lists death. Consider the power of God, able to make our greatest enemy surrender to our greatest good. God accomplishes our good even through death. Number eight in our survey this morning, a believer's death is different. A believer's death is different. While we still must face physical death unless you're raptured, death has been changed for the believer. While the unbelievers walk around physically alive but spiritually dead, The believer in Jesus Christ walks around in newness of life, eternal life, life in Christ, life that never ends, even through the demise of your physical frame. And the New Testament overwhelmingly reflects this truth. You were dead in your sins. You were made alive by God's grace through faith in the work of Jesus Christ and the cross. And now for you, believer, you will never die spiritually. And even physical death has been fundamentally and eternally altered. The vocabulary of the New Testament reflects this truth. Believers are considered to be alive now and forever. Death cannot separate you from the love of God. And even the words used to describe a believer's physical death are changed. They are changed If you survey the language that the New Testament uses to describe the death of a Christian, what you find is absolutely staggering. First of all, a believer's physical death can be called death or being killed. It can use all the normal thanatology words that the Bible uses for death. However, these death words for a Christian, are used when death is spoken of generally, when I make an abstract statement about life or death. And they often occur when martyrdom or persecution are in view. 
when a Christian is being killed, when someone else is uh, being highlighted as doing the killing. But far more often, a believer's physical death is not described with the death vocabulary. Every time an unbeliever dies, he's said to have died. But I found at least 45 euphemisms for death that describe a Christian's departure from this life. And I say euphemisms, they're not really euphemisms. A euphemism is, is when you try to soften up some harsh reality by not speaking quite truthfully about it, but make it sound nice. That's not what the Bible is doing here. The Bible is not using a figure of speech to soften the idea of death, such as, oh, he's in a better place now. Rather, the death blow dealt to death by Jesus, has rendered physical death to be substantially different for those who are in Christ. So much so that the vocabulary is changing. Even in John 11, when Jesus was describing Lazarus to his disciples, he said, our brother Lazarus is asleep. Do you remember what the disciples said? They said, well, if he's sleeping, he'll wake up. We don't want to go anywhere near Jerusalem uh, Lazarus uh, lived just outside of Jerusalem, kind of like a suburb. And the last time the disciples were in Ju Jerusalem, uh, the religious leaders tried to kill Jesus. So the disciples said, we're not going back anywhere near there. If Lazarus is asleep, he'll get up again. Let him take care of that on his own. And Jesus said, I need to speak plainly to you now. Our brother Lazarus is dead. But you see what Jesus was doing already in John 11, even before he went to the cross, he is already changing the way death of a believer is described. He called it sleep. And it's not really a euphemism. And I've counted 45 of these I want to share with you this morning. 1 Corinthians 5.10, going out of this world. Death is renamed to go out of this world. Sleep is used often. 1 Corinthians 11 and 15, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5, use it over and again. Paul talks about surrendering his body in 1 Corinthians 13. That's an interesting way to describe death. I'm just going to surrender my body. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul describes it as seeing and knowing now versus seeing and knowing then. That's interesting. Cognition and love and knowledge and seeing. In other words, the, the same you goes from here to there or from here to then and death is not the end of you. It's not the end of your thinking and your loving and your relational abilities. It's just the difference between now and then or here and there. It's not some empty, mysterious, black void. You get to know and see him. In 1 Corinthians 15, death is described as being sown like a seed and raised. The last time you planted a watermelon vine in your garden, did you say, well, we're just going to kill this seed? You, you, you plant a seed. Something's changing in the vocabulary of death for those who are in Christ to where your movement from time into eternity is compared to the planting of a seed. A contrast is made in 1 Corinthians 15 between the earthy and the heavenly man. What is death? A transition between that which is earthy and that which is heavenly. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, death is called inheriting the kingdom of God. That's a good one. It's also called inheriting the imperishable. You become all of a sudden the inheritor, the possessor of that which can never rust, never fade, never perish. Paul calls it being changed in 1 Corinthians 15. 
That's a good thing to say at a believer's memorial service. He got changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. He just put on the imperishable. He put on immortality, 1 Corinthians 15, 53. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. The outer man is decaying. And it ends in a final decay. But it's the outer man that decays. The inner man, which is being renewed day by day, just moves home. Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 5.1 his tent being torn down. It's like you've been camping for a couple of weeks and you're grimy and you're dirty and you've been moving from place to place in this temporary shelter that doesn't hold out water very well and you tear down that tent, fold it up, put it in the truck and drive home and get a hot shower. Moving from this life to the next is like having that tent torn down. Dying is described in 2 Corinthians 5.21 as acquiring our building from God. In 2 Corinthians 5.2, as being clothed with our dwelling from heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5.3, as no longer being naked. In 2 Corinthians 5.4, as being clothed. 2 Corinthians 5.4 says, what is mortal shall be swallowed up by life. I was watching R.C. Sproul's memorial service and couldn't help thinking, this man just got swallowed up by life. To be absent from the body is to have died physically. Paul calls it being absent from the body. He also calls it being at home with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9. In Philippians 1.23, he talks about departing. I'm going to depart. In Philippians 1.23, he calls it being with Christ, which he says is better by far than being here. 1 Thessalonians 4 calls believers who have died physically the dead in Christ. That is, they are in him sleeping from our perspective, dead from our perspective, but very much alive and awake with him. 1 Thessalonians 5.10, death is referred to as living together with him. Paul calls his own impending martyrdom being poured out as a drink offering, that which is pleasing to the Lord, being expended for the Lord's sake. He calls it a departure in 2 Timothy 4.6 and 2 Peter 1.15. In 2 Timothy 4.7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. And he's speaking proleptically or, or future about his coming death. And he says, I have fought the good fight. He also says, I have finished the course. How does Paul view the death of a believer? Crossing the finish line, breaking the tape ran his race, fought his fight, finished the course. He says, I have kept the faith. In 2 Timothy 4, 18, Paul talks about being rescued from every evil deed. He says, I know this, I will be rescued from every evil deed. Church history tells us that Paul was decapitated by Nero. That is a rescue from an evil deed. What a great way to describe his departure. He talks about being brought safely home to his heavenly kingdom, 2 Timothy 4.18. The author of Hebrews encourages believers to go out to him outside the camp. Go out to Jesus, who was crucified outside of Jerusalem. Go out to him. Do not fear death, but go be with him. He described old... Uh, Old Testament believers as those who are seeking the city which is to come. How do you seek the city which is to come? How do you get there? We pass through physical death. Peter describes life on earth as the time of our stay on earth. The time of our stay on earth. 
He also calls it the rest of the time in the flesh. These things are temporary. This isn't home. This is a short time. We are sojourners here. Peter talks about those who are being persecuted as entrusting their souls to a faithful creator. When your body fails, you may entrust your soul to a faithful creator. Peter talks about believers being perfected, confirmed, strengthened, and established, thinking about what it's going to be like when we are home. He talks about our entrance into the eternal kingdom in 2 Peter 1.11. Peter says, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, in 2 Peter 1.14, he talks about laying aside that earthly dwelling. John the Apostle, both in 1 John 5 and in the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, talks about the overcomer. The overcomer. An overcomer, by definition, in 1 John 5, is the one who believes in Jesus. And in those letters to the seven churches, over and again, the overcomer is the one who remains faithful unto and through death. Jude 24 talks about believers being made to stand in the presence of his glory. What a great thing that would be to say at a memorial service. He was just made to stand in the presence of of God's glory, blameless with great joy. Tribulation martyrs in Revelation 7.14 are said to come out of the tribulation. How do they come out of the tribulation? They were martyred for their loyalty to Christ. And they're said simply to come out. In Revelation 13, the author describes the perseverance and the faith of the saints. And in that context, it is their death that is being described. And he calls it their perseverance and their faith. And so he says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will receive, Revelation 14, 13, rest from their labors. The deaf language falls apart for the Christian Aside from general statements or descriptions of martyrdom or being killed, the normal words for death, the normal vocabulary for death, don't rightly describe what it means for you and for me to go home. And we can cry out with the Apostle Paul, Oh, death, where is your sting? And we can cry out with the New Testament, Oh, death, where is your vocabulary? And we can say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1.21, truly to die is gain. That it is better by far to be with him. 2 Corinthians 5.8, Paul says, we are of good courage and we prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. One final point in our survey. Death itself will die. Death itself will die. In Acts 2.24, Peter is preaching Jesus and the resurrection. He says, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for Jesus to be held in death's power. Did you hear that? It was impossible for Jesus, the author of life, to be held in death's power. Who is stronger we don't fear death because we fear the one who's stronger than death. That is Jesus who conquers death. Romans 6, 9, Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Jesus is in charge. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, the writer says, since the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself also partook of the same, <laughs> 
that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. Revelation 118, Jesus identifies himself this way. I am the living one. I was, de- I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and of Hades. In Revelation 20, verse 14, death and Hades themselves are personified and thrown into the lake of fire. In Revelation 21, 4, with a new heavens and a new earth come this promise. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. No such thing as death anymore. No more need for the separation of immaterial and material humanity. Why is all of this possible? Simply because Jesus himself experienced death in our place. He died the death that we deserve. And in uniting believers to his death, he affects a death for them. It's right for your story to sound something like this. I died when I was in grade school. And then I went to junior high and high school and college and grad school, got married, have five kids, and I'm standing now before you as alive forevermore, telling you about how you can be alive forevermore if you are united to Jesus Christ. That is a Christian's testimony. If you are born once, you will die twice. And if you're born twice, you die once. Maybe. Death is, for the Christian, de-stingered, reworked, repurposed, It is that enemy. It is painful. It brings sorrow. For those of us who remain and grieve the loss of a beloved believer, we mourn our temporary loss. We don't mourn for her or for him. We do not grieve as the world does, either hopeless and bitter or propping yourself up with empty wishes. Part of us envies those who have gone home already. When we mourn the loss of an unbeliever, we lament a tragedy of infinite proportions, do we not? We take comfort in the goodness of God, a goodness that we will not fully comprehend this side of eternity, but a goodness that God has demonstrated to be reliable and sweet and unfailing over and over and over again. We trust Him and we preach the gospel. To those who walk this earth as the spiritually dead for whom there is still hope for life. And if you're here this morning and you have not yet passed out of death into life, you need to know that Jesus offers you himself. He is the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in him will live even if he dies. And if you believe in him, you will never die. Do you believe this? At my funeral... You can use any of the phrases that the New Testament employs to recalibrate our thinking about a believer's physical demise. Or you can combine a few of them and say something like this. He has left the land of the dying and has gone safely home. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for conquering death. For conquering death by experiencing death and by experiencing death in a way no man ever will. By experiencing the full-fledged fury of your Father against every sin, past, present, and future of everyone who would ever believe in you. 
all that sin, all that guilt heaped upon you, punished in full by your holy father. You drank his wrath to the dregs, so there is not a drop left for those who believe in you. Would you be pleased, O oh Jesus, to raise the dead here this morning and give new life to those who recognize, perhaps for the first time, that they need it? And would you forever recalibrate our hearts and thoughts around the truth of life and the truth of death for those who trust in you? It's in your sweet, conquering name we pray.